Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Excellent lecture, very clear. We're now going to move on uh, in the program, and this is where I need to close this and open this. To introduce the next speaker, which is our very own Andrea Mosley, uh, current and native of uh, Qatar and the senior physiotherapist at uh, Aspatar since January 2013. Uh, long clinical experience as a sports uh, physical therapist. Uh, and since uh, she joined us here, uh, working uh, on a large prospective trial looking at risk factors for hip and groin injury, precisely the kind of study that uh, Jackie uh, just uh, was asking for in her review. So the floor is yours, um, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Roel. Can everyone hear me clearly? I will try to speak slowly. I understand the Australian accent is at times rather difficult. So uh, thank you for listening to this presentation on the systematic review that we've been conducting this year. I would first like to welcome all of our visitors to Doha and I really hope you have a fantastic stay in this amazing country. Right, so we've just heard hip and groin pain. We've had uh, two recently published systematic reviews looking at risk factors. Uh, Jackie will now publish a more recent update. And uh, it's interesting that with the update, we haven't actually got any more answers about risk factors, but uh, it's been identified in these systematic reviews that a past history of injury, some conflicting evidence on flexibility and adductor strength have been identified as risk factors for hip and groin pain. However, these systematic reviews uh, do not provide an overview of some of the measurable factors that can differentiate athletes with hip and groin pain from those without. So that's the aim of our systematic review, to conduct a systematic review and meta-analysis on the factors that we can use to differentiate athletes with and without hip and groin pain. Methodology, we're all familiar with the systematic review methodology. We consulted the PRISMA guidelines, did a comprehensive database search of nine databases and we conducted that in June of this year. Our selection criteria, is, uh, I'd like you to focus on this because it uh, indicates which, which studies were our final included studies. So we had athletes with hip and groin pain and matched athletic controls and this significantly narrowed down our inclusion criteria and the number of included studies that we could have in the review. The type of studies that we were looking at were case control, cohort and cross-sectional designs and we had a, limited, uh, a minimum N of 10 uh, case and 10 control subjects and again this narrowed down our inclusion criteria significantly. And these studies needed to examine at least one measurable factor that could be used to differentiate athletes with groin pain and those without. We used the modified Langham Downs and Black scale and two of the reviewers rated the methodological quality and it had a maximum score of 16. We both uh, conducted data extraction and data synthesis. So we had a lot of hits. We got rid of duplicates and ended up with 43 full text articles that we read. After excluding for these reasons, our final included articles was 17. In terms of methodological quality, we rated a high quality study as 12 out of 16 for the modified Downs and Black scale, which is around 75% score. We had six moderate quality studies, 10 to 12 out of 16 for the Downs and Black score and one low quality study which we, we, we uh, still included in the review. So in terms of uh, synthesising the data, we had five main categories of factors that we included in the review. The first category we're going to discuss is pain provocation tests, range of motion, strength, trunk function and radiological factors. There's a couple of other uh, categories but I won't, uh, for time I won't include those today. In terms of the definitions of evidence, we use the Van Tilda definition of strong, moderate, limited, conflicting and no evidence and I will continually uh, refer to these levels of evidence in uh, explaining the results. In terms of ex effect sizes for the meta-analysis, the standardised means difference, we, we use the Cohen's D categories. 
All right, so now to the fun stuff, the results. So first of all, looking at pain provocation tests. The first one we looked at, everyone's familiar with this uh, adductor squeeze test conducted in 45 degrees. We were able to do a meta-analysis of two high quality studies. And the results of this meta-analysis, or just to orientate you to the forest plot, on the left hand side we have reduced hip and groin pain on the left of the forest plot and on the right hand side increase in hip and groin pain. Here are the two high quality studies and you see quite convincingly, except the laser pointer doesn't work, that um, you can see quite convincingly that the confidence intervals for these two high quality studies sit very neatly and overall there is a, approximately a four times greater chance that your athlete will sit in the hip and groin pain group if you have a positive finding on the pain provocation test of the adductor squeeze. In terms of the other pain provocation tests that we commonly use in the, uh, in the area of hip and groin pain, they have only been evaluated in single studies and this means the maximum level of evidence that one can achieve is a limited evidence. So we have Jeff Verrill's two adductor tests, the single adductor and the bilateral adductor test and we can see here these high odds ratios but wide confidence intervals because they're only evaluated in single studies. We have the active straight leg raise test from the men's study, the pelvic belt test also from the men's study and the impingement test from the Stephen Rock study. So we have high odds ratios, wide confidence intervals, limited evidence because these pain provocation tests have only been evaluated in single studies. When we look at range of motion, I'm going to start with the bent knee fallout and I'll just orientate you to this picture here. You can see when with an athlete presenting with uh, hip and groin pain or a control, the higher the measure, the less flexible the athlete is with this test, which is different from what we are familiar with. Again, we have two high quality studies and we can see here that in these studies, the SMD sits on the right hand side of the forest plot. And that means when we synthesise the data, high quality studies, so there's strong evidence that this test is less flexible, i.e. a greater range in the, a greater score in the bent knee fallout in uh, hip and groin pain athletes compared to control subjects. And the effect size is moderate because the uh, SMD is 0.75. The next range of motion test we're going to look at is the hip internal rotation in 90 degrees of flexion. Two moderate quality studies and here on the left hand side where we have a smaller, uh, a, a, a smaller range of motion it means that the test is less flexible. And what we can find with this test is that because there were moderate quality studies there is moderate evidence that that internal rotation measured in 90 degrees of flexion is less flexible in hip and groin pain subjects compared to healthy controls and the effect size is moderate with an SMD of 0.58. Next range of motion test that we look at is hip internal rotation in neutral flexioning section and actually we had three high quality studies that used this test and compared uh, athletes with pain and those without pain. And what we found, you can see here the confidence intervals actually cross the zero in two of these studies and the SMD is very close to zero. So what that tells us is that there is strong evidence that this test is actually only a little bit less flexible in athletes with groin pain and the effect size is weak, 0.42. Hip external rotation in 90 degrees flexion, one moderate quality study, so only limited evidence uh, and also a weak effect size of 0.47 and hip external rotation in neutral flexion extension. This was again evaluated in those same three high quality studies and we can see here the confidence intervals cross the zero with all three studies. The SMD even crosses the zero. So there's strong evidence that this test does not differentiate between the hip and groin pain athletes and the healthy controls with an SMD of only 0.18. Okay, let's go on to strength. It was very nice for Jackie to mention adductor strength. Uh, it fits very nicely with what we found from our systematic review. So there was four high quality studies that examined adductor strength to see if this test will differentiate between those with pain and those without pain and the results are quite interesting. So we can see all four studies sit on the left hand side of the forest plot here. Okay? So they all show that there is a difference between athletes with pain and athletes that don't have pain and that the athletes have a lower score on the adductor squeeze test in terms of strength. What is different between the four studies 
is the magnitude of the, of the difference between the, the athletes with pain and those without. And that's represented by this high statistical heterogeneity. So you can see here we have two studies that sit quite nicely together and another two studies that sit quite nicely together. Now all four studies use the same test with the same range of motion, same um, uh, population. They, two of them use the sphygmometer, two of them use a the handheld dynamometer, but actually one of each is represented in, in, the, in here, one of each is represented here. So we can't put it down to different populations, different units of measurement. We probably just need more studies to uh, have a clearer picture about what the magnitude of difference between the uh, athletes with pain and those without. But what we can be confident in with, uh, with our clinical management is that this test will differentiate between athletic controls and, uh, and those with pain and it will be lower in those with pain. And overall, if you look at the SMD, this is a large effect size for this test, larger than any of the other tests that I've uh, mentioned. Okay, trunk muscle function was very interesting. So we had uh, three studies that we included in the review and there was considerable methodological heterogeneity between the three studies. We had one high quality study that looked at EMG onset times. I think everyone's familiar with this study. We had another study looking at the thickness of the abdominal muscles on ultrasound and a third study looking at isokinetic strength testing using a, a dynamometer. So despite the fact that different aspects of muscle function were assessed with these three studies, if we consolidate the data, it does appear that trunk muscle function is altered in our athletes with hip and groin pain. And this fits with some of the intervention studies that have been successful that have also addressed trunk, trunk muscle function with those intervention studies. But we clearly need more consistent methodology. We couldn't meta-analyse this data and uh, I, I encourage this to be an area of future research. Okay, radiological findings. So we had one low quality study that looked at x-ray and whether pubic bone abnormalities were different between athletes with pain and without pain. Because it's only one low quality study, even though they found a statistically significant difference between the two groups, we only currently have limited evidence that an X-ray will be able to differentiate athletes with pain and those without. When we look at MRI, one of the features that's been discussed a lot in the literature is bone edema. So this is quite interesting results. We had three studies, all of them moderate quality, that looked at the presence of bone edema and compared between athletes with pain and athletic controls. And we can see quite clearly from this forest plot, we have two studies that sit within each other's uh, confidence intervals and this widespread to this uh, study on top, the Cunningham study. And in the Cunningham study, you can see that out of a, a hundred included controls, none of them had bone edema on their MRI and this very uh, strange ratio here. So we conducted a um, sensitivity analysis. You can see this very high statistical heterogeneity with an I squared of 88%. So when we re-examined the forest plot following the removal of the Cunningham study, it looks much neater and the two studies uh, sit very nicely together. Low statistical heterogeneity and overall we can see there's moderate evidence that this um, sign is more prevalent in hip and groin pain athletes. When we look at the secondary cleft sign, this is another um, recent popular thing in the literature, we have two moderate quality studies uh, actually from the same radiolo radiology clinic and here again we have, a hun I just want to alert you to 170 controls, none of which presented with the secondary cleft sign. And this is contradictory to other studies of asymptomatic athletes that have found this uh, sign to be present. But we have to synthesise the data that's included in this uh, systematic review and at, the, at present there is moderate evidence that the secondary cleft sign is more prevalent in hip and groin pain athletes compared to controls. Finally, this is probably the most disappointing thing about the review. We were hoping to have a nice meta-analysis of the, of the finding, radiological findings of FAI, but we could actually only include one moderate quality study that looked at the radiological features of FAI and compared athletes with groin pain and athletes without groin pain. And in this study there was a statistically significant difference in the area of the head neck junction which corresponds to the CAM lesion, but we currently actually have limited evidence in the type of studies that we assess for the systematic review. So, take home messages. 
if we're designing a screening study, one of these large prospective studies that Jackie mentioned, or if we are uh, looking at in the clinic or for research purposes, the following tests we can be confident with moderate to strong levels of evidence will differentiate our painful athletes from athletes without pain. And that's the pain on the adductor squeeze test, the bent knee fallout test, hip internal rotation and 90 degrees flexion, strength on the adductor squeeze test, but clearly we need more consistent methodology and scientific rigour in future studies, particularly in the areas of radiology and trunk muscle function. I would like to sincerely thank the, uh, my wonderful co-authors, particularly Rinche sitting in the front row and was heavily involved in this uh, systematic review. Thank you.